television program. If you're looking for Laurel and Hardy, I left my derby and I left my cane, but I did bring my Bible. If you'll read along with me, you'll find that the persons who are making the accusations, they're really the ones who have a problem. I hear them telling you to shut up, that you're going to be embarrassed, and I even hear them flat out saying, I'm telling you what to do as a pastor. Give me a chance, and I'll give you what does the Bible say. Always ask for, what does the Bible say? Are you going to church only to find a club? Are you tired of looking for the Bible but only getting babble? If you want to find people who are studying God's Word, come examine the Church of Christ. We're meeting right here at 250 the Boulevard in downtown Eden. If you want to hear more plain Bible teaching, watch A Word from the Lord Thursday nights at 9 o'clock right here on WGSR. I couldn't stay in Johnny at first. I thought he was a nut. And once I read the Bible for myself, I'm able to accept the truth now. All right. And it doesn't make me angry. I'm talking about the Lauren Hardy show on Wednesday. Don't worry about them, some y'all. Get off of it, would you? Don't dare do that again. Shut that up. Shut that up. Shut that up. As your pastor, I am telling you, please. Don't waste your time on Wednesday nights watching this television program. If you're looking for Laurel and Hardy, I left my derby and I left my cane, but I did bring my Bible. If you'll read along with me, you'll find that the persons who are making the accusations, they're really the ones who have a problem. I hear them telling you to shut up, that you're going to be embarrassed, and I even hear them flat out saying, I'm telling you what to do as a pastor. Give me a chance and I'll give you what does the Bible say. Always ask for, what does the Bible say? Are you going to church only to find a club? Are you tired of looking for the Bible but only getting babble? If you want to find people who are studying God's Word, come examine the Church of Christ. We're meeting right here at 250 the Boulevard in downtown Eden. If you want to hear more plain Bible teaching, watch A Word from the Lord Thursday nights at 9 o'clock right here on WGSR. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to a Word from the Lord. Thanks for watching. Hope you had a so had some good calls coming in on uh, what does the Bible say there with uh, uh, Micah and Mark, Eminem. Uh, very, very tasty, tasty things to eat, I guess. Giving you some uh, very Tid, good tidbits from the Word of God and uh, what I heard. And uh, good to have everyone in the audience. Those of you who are watching on the internet, I just got a phone with one of the elders from the church, from a church in uh, in Texas. He said he was watching. I uh, told him where to find us on WGSR 47.tv. And uh, he uh, he uh, logged on and he was watching the, the program. So I don't know. Uh, uh, he said he was going to try to call in. I don't know if he did or not, but Nonetheless, and then we got a brother from Greensboro or High Point, Greensboro, High Point, in in the studio with us. Dropped by, and uh, good to see him. So we're we're just uh, abounding with brotherly love here on the on the set of a word from the Lord, and we hope that you will come and be with us, participate with our assemblies, and and try to examine the Word of God with us. Church of Christ, we're meeting at two fifty the Boulevard in Eden, North Carolina, two seven six three four zero two six five three or three three six. Three nine four five seven two one is where we're meeting, and uh, you can reach me at a word from the Lord at gmail.com. I hope that you will take advantage of that. Uh, remember the tent meeting coming up June twenty second through July fourth, and uh, just go ahead and mark that down in your calendars, and uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing you at the uh, uh, the parking lot of Leggett's Leggett's parking lot in Danville. It's if you were uh, if you came out to the tent last fall it's the same place we may even uh, be fortunate enough to drive the stakes in the same holes now, that'd be nice with it because <clears throat> that was some hard hard asphalt out there but anyway come out and be with us at the tent we look forward to uh, uh, seeing you there friends we want you to to know that we are all about studying God's Word and we want you to examine carefully why you believe what you believe tonight I want to give you a lesson that I think will help you see maybe where you are. You know, one of the things about the Bible that we try to get people to re realize is this Bible is a mirror. James tells us in James 1, verse 23 through 25, that it is a looking glass. It's the perfect law of liberty. 
And when you look into the Bible, you actually get to see yourself as God sees you. Now, you may not like everything you see, but it will definitely show you who you are. And just to demonstrate, just to demonstrate how it is, sometimes people, when they see themselves, they don't see the truth. You know, sometimes people with uh, certain kind of eating disorders, when they look in the mirror, they see someone who's fat, even though they may be thin as a rail. Other people see someone who's ugly and they think they need some kind of cosmetic surgery because they see someone who's ugly when in reality they're pretty. But when you look into the Word of God, you need to see the truth and accept it. And sometimes it is the case that just because what you see doesn't mean that's what you believe. The old saying seeing is believing is not always true, especially when it comes to the truth. I want to demonstrate this by telling you something from history. Aristotle, great philosopher, said uh, uh, that, or he philosophized, theorized, that heavier objects will fall faster than lighter objects. And when he said that, because he was a great, well-respected uh, philosopher and, and orator, that they just, they, they accepted it. No one tested it. And so it was 2,000 years before anyone ever decided that, you know what, we're going to test this theory. We're going to test this statement to see if it's really true. We've heard it's true. We've heard that heavier objects fall faster than lighter objects, and everybody accepted it as face value, but no one really came out and said, well, wait a minute. You know, we heard that. Let's just see if it's true. And so it was in the year 1589 that a fellow by the name of Galileo, he comes along and he says, I'm going to test this theory. I'm going to see if in, if in fact what Aristotle said some 2,000 years ago was indeed true. And so he took two balls, two objects, one weighed 10 pounds, one weighed one pound, and he took them up to the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And he took some of the professors and the, uh, the scholars of the day, and he said, we're going to just test this theory to see if it's, if it's true or not. And so what he did, he took these two objects, 10-pound ball and a 1-pound ball, or a 10-pound object, 1-pound object, and took them up to the top of the, the, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and he dropped them off. And guess what happened? The heavier object hit the ground the same time as the one-pound object. It wasn't, it wasn't the case that the heavier object, that the heavier object uh, falls faster than the uh, lighter object. They fell at the same rate of speed. And do you know what happened? When this happened, when it was demonstrated that, you know what, heavier objects fall at the same rate as the, as the lighter objects, when it was proven that what Aristotle theorized was not true, do you know that the people who sat there and saw it with their own eyes still held on to the belief that Aristotle was right? Even though he had obviously been proven wrong, they still said, no, he's right. Now, do you see how it is? Seeing is not always believing because some people will look right at the truth and still say, no, that's not right. That's not right. Let me give you another example. Uh, Hippocrates talked about scur scurvy. He, he described scurvy, which is this, this uh, uh, disease that affects the, the, the mouth, the gums, the teeth, and so forth. And he, he described this uh, during his lifetime. He lived 460 to 370 B.C. So, three or four hundred years before Christ, he was describing this disease. And it was noted that individuals who were under siege, you know, citizens of a city that were under siege, or armies that were out in the field a long time and away from fresh food, were plagued by this, by this disease. And no one really knew why it was the case or what was causing it or, or how to remedy it. Well, it was soon found that sailors on long voyages would actually contract this disease and would even die. Actually, it was on one particular voyage from a, 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 a ship commander by the name of uh, Carlay, I believe was his name. He had 103 men on his ship, and 100 of them died, as was, or, or were at least were affected, by scurvy. So 100 out of 103 were affected by scurvy. And so no one knew what it was called. Well, in 1553, Admiral... Sir Richard Hawkins noted that 10,000 men died of scurvy, 
but also noted that it was remedied or it was uh, uh, kind of put to a halt or even cured by individuals if they ate sour oranges or lemons on their voyages. And it seemed to cure this, this plague. No one really knew why, but for some reason, these oranges and lemons actually helped this disease of scurry. Well, here you have individuals who are being plagued by disease, and someone has, has stumbled upon a cure. 200 years later, a man named James Lynn, the British naval surgeon, he determined that scurvy could be eliminated if you simply supplied sailors or individuals who were uh, uh, deficient of, of, of a particular vitamin, if you would simply supply them with lemon juice. If you just supply them with lemon juice or some kind of uh, juice, oranges and lemon and so forth, you would actually, you would actually cure, the, cure uh, the, the, the problem. And they actually started uh, uh, taking notes and writing down instances where if, you, if a sailor ate oranges or lemons and so forth, they actually improved. And so they started documenting it all. Anything with vitamin C would prevent scurvy. Now, this is what James Lind published in 1753. Now, you would think, you would think that someone who actually has prevented a terrible disease from running rampant through the whole naval fleet will be held up, lauded, and, and applauded, and uh, uh, given great regard, but you know what? He wasn't. And Lind was ridiculed for this belief, even though he was proving it, even though he was demonstrating that if you'll simply eat oranges and lemons and you'll provide them with vitamin C or some lemon juice, he didn't say vitamin C, but if you provide them with lemon juice, you will actually <clears throat> benefit. Well, he was ridiculed. And this is what he said about the ridicule. He said, some persons cannot be brought to believe that a disease so fatal and so dreaded can be cured or prevented by such easy means. He found it astonishing that the simple things, the simple solutions, the very uh, easy things could actually be a cure. People said, no, it can't be that easy. It can't be that, can't be that simple. It has to be something great or complex. Well, that was what James Lynn discovered. Do you know that in 1776, Captain James Cook was reading Lynn's journals and, and noted that his advice and said, you know what, I'm going to try this. And he stocked his ships with fruits and, and uh, uh, made sure that his uh, uh, sailors were given this daily supply. <clears throat> and the result was his sailors didn't get sick. And James Cook was honored you know, hey, he takes care of his sailors. But you know what? The fact that he said, hey, I got this advice from, from James Lynn. I got this from the, the British naval surgeon that you rejected. No, they, they, they didn't have any effect on them. In, in 1794, the British Navy stocked lemon juice on their ships before voyages. They realized, hey, this is an effect. This is, this is something good. This is something good. But it wasn't a requirement. It wasn't a requirement for yet another decade. In other words, the Navy didn't start saying, you will stock lemons and oranges and so forth, a supply of, of, of these citrus fruits on board in order to prevent scurvy until yet another decade later. Now look at this. 1753. 1753 till 1794. 40 years later, 41 years later, they finally decided, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, 50 years later, 50 years later, they finally recognized, hey, this is the answer to all of our problems. Now, friends, the reason I say all that is because seeing is not always believing, and there's a reason why some people fight against the truth, even though it's right in front of them. Even though it's right in front of them, some people will fight against truth. Now, Here's where I'm going with this, friends. I think you probably know. We, from the Church of Christ, are trying to tell you the plain truth. We don't add to this book. We don't have catechisms and creed books and manuals. We don't have confessions of faith, and we don't have all these conventions that we go to. We don't look at the Pope and say, well, Pope, give us something uh, from, the, from the throne that we can uh, uh, use as God's law. We simply say, this is God's book. The Bible is right. Let's go to it and find out what the truth is. And some people 
when they simply hear a verse from the Bible, when they hear the sum of God's word telling them what the truth of the matter is, they will still sit there and reject it. And I'm going to tell you why. There's a number of reasons why people simply reject the truth. And it may be, friends, that you find that you're in that boat, that you are in that category of individual who will sit here and look dead straight into the face, into the face of, of, the, of the mirror of life, the perfect law of liberty. You will look right into the God's word, and you'll sit there and say, no, I won't accept it. And there's going to be some reasons why. It may be, if you're sitting there tonight on your couch in your recliner, and you're sitting there and you're saying, well, I've heard you I've heard y'all on TV every week, James. I watch you on TV. I watch Johnny on TV. I watch Micah and Mark on TV. And I've seen y'all. I've been watching y'all for 10 years on TV. And I'm just not going to accept it. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you some reasons why you won't accept it. And just see if that doesn't wake you up. See if I can't describe you in one of these ways. Here's why people reject the truth. Number one, it may be because of tradition. You know, when it comes down to traditions, people like to hang on to traditions. They just like to hold on to something that they've been doing over and over and over and over and over, and they never stop and think about why they're doing what they're doing. Look in Matthew in Mark 7. Let's see if we can pull this up here. Mark 7. <clears throat> we lost our signal over here on the TV. Uh, if someone can help me. Mark 7, verse 3. Uh, this is what Jesus says. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands off, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. Now they accuse Jesus' disciples of defiling themselves and not keeping the tradition of the fathers. And when they came... And when they came from the market, except they wash, they eat not, and many other things there be which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and pots and brazen vessels and of tables. Then the Pharisees and the scribes ask him, verse 5, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashing hands? Now notice, why do you not keep the traditions of the elders? You're actually eating with your hands dirty. And he answered and said unto them, Well, hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit, in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines and commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, here it is, laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and of cup and cups, and many other such like things do ye. For he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. Now friends, that is exactly why many of you <clears throat> will not accept the truth, because you would rather reject the Bible in, in order to hold to your traditions. Now what am I talking about? Well, how about this? How about the tradition of instrumental music? You know what? That was a tradition that wasn't started in the New Testament church. That was a tradition that came from the Catholics. They're the first one that brought it in. You see, you're holding on to these traditions, and you don't even know where they come from, friends. See, but this is the tradition you're holding on to. Listen to what the Bible says about traditions of men. In Colossians 2, 8, Paul said, Beware, lest any man spoil you. And that word spoil means to pillage and plunder. That's why all these pirate pastors out here we call them. Pirate pastors, they're here spoiling you. They're stealing all your money. Let someone spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men. Now that's where it comes from, friend. That's a tradition of men that has been, has been brought into your worship and you do it and you do it and you go over and you do it and do it and do it and do it simply because that's what you learned. You never stop to examine, hey, is this tradition an inspired tradition or is it a man-made tradition? See, is this something I'm just doing out of habit or ritual? Or is it something that I am learning from God? <clears throat> you know, I saw a poll on the news the other day that 44% of individuals uh, who consider themselves religious were not in the religion 
that they were raised in. Now, you know what that tells me? That tells me they're starting to reevaluate their traditions. Now, I think that's a good thing. And I hope that one of the reasons why individuals in this area may be reevaluating what they've always been taught is because, is because they're hearing the truth and they're not going to just hold on to something they've been taught simply because they've been taught it. As a matter of fact, and I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, I'm not going to say his name, but Tuesday I baptized a man who, who was raised in the Episcopalian church. And the, one of the things that he said... Uh, as he, as he uh, was discussing obeying the gospel and leaving the Episcopalian church, was he said, you know, he said it just wasn't right. Everything I saw, the more I listened, the more I learned, the more I realized that was not my tradition. That was not the right tradition. That was a man-made tradition. Now, friends, you've got to realize this. You can't hold on to this tradition of men. Look, if you want to hold on to tradition, you need to hold on to the tradition of God. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 2, Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. These ordinances come from God. Now, <clears throat> what were they? Well, notice this. Notice this. In uh, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 15. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. Here's what Paul says. Paul says, Therefore, brethren... Stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistles. If you want to hold it to a, to a tradition, friends, why don't you make sure that it's in the Word of God? Why don't you make sure that it is an inspired apostolic tradition? That is, it's what Paul commanded, or it's what he wrote. Make sure that it's what the apostles in the first century taught by their epistles or by their words, and not by what you got from your mom and your daddy. Now, that's a tradition you can hold to. That's what you need to be holding to. That's what you need to be uh, 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 holding on to. But when you hear traditions, when you hear traditions, you need to stop and say, well, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? I wish I had it at my fingertips, and I'd have, to, I'd have to find it and dig around. But I wish I had to play for you the gentleman who called in and said, we know denominations aren't in the Bible. We, we, they were named by our fathers. Well, Hello. You just admitted. It's a man-made tradition, friend. Get out of the Baptist church. Come out of the Methodist church, the Presbyterian church. It's not in the Bible. It's not in the, in the inspired traditions. You see? What are you holding to? Why, 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 are, you, why are you holding to these traditions? Look, the Apostle Paul changed traditions. Look at this. The Apostle Paul said in Galatians 1.13 and 14, he says, For ye have heard of my conversation my manner of life in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many mine equals in my own nation being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. He wasn't zealous for God. He was zealous for his father's traditions, the things that his fathers had taught him. Why, why are you in the Baptist church? Just go ahead and ask yourself. No one's, no one's noticing you. No one's looking at you. No one's, no one's asking for you to give an answer out loud. You just sit there in your house, sit there on your couch in your recliner, and you just, you just answer yourself. Why am I in this church? Why am I in the Baptist church? Why am I in the Methodist church? Why am I in the Lutheran church? Why am I in the Holiness church? Why am I here? Why do I do what I do? Is it tradition that you got from the Bible? Or is it a tradition that you got from man. And if it's a tradition from man, why are you kicking against the truth? You know, in Acts 9, verses 4 and 5, Saul of Tarsus, <clears throat> who was persecuting the church of God because he was zealous for the tradition of his fathers, look what he says. And actually what Jesus says to him, Acts 9 and verse 4, when Saul of Tarsus met Jesus on the road to Damascus, this is what he said. Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. All you're doing is you're hurting yourself. Whenever you kick, you're hurting yourself. You, you fight against God. Now, friends, is that really why you're holding on to this tradition? Are you fighting against God? Why are you kicking? Why are you fighting so much at it? See? Why are you fighting so much? 
Well, it may be that you're struggling with seeing the truth and you know you're going to have to give up these traditions. That's one reason why people, uh, even though they see the truth, that's one reason why they hold on to it. Here's another reason. They think negatively. They think about all the negative things. They think about all the things that they're going to have to, have to, um, all the reasons why they don't need it or why they shouldn't take it, why they shouldn't buy it. You know, in John 8, 32, 33, Jesus said, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Why do you, and Jesus said, Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my words? Look at what he says. He says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they said, We not in bondage? Well, they were. They were under Roman rule. They were subjection to the Roman government as they were speaking. And then to say, we've never been in bondage. Do you not remember that God even said to Abraham in Genesis 15, he said, your seed are going to be uh, servants in a strange land for 400 years? Do you think they had forgotten about this big stretch of time when Joseph was down into Egypt and Israel took all his brothers down to Egypt and that's where they became the nation of Israel? They seem to have blocked that out of their history books. Sound like some people today, they want to deny history. They want to say, well, it didn't happen. Well, that's what the Jews are saying. We don't need that. We've we never been in bondage to anybody. You know why people don't obey the gospel? It's because they sit there and they say, I don't need to obey the gospel. I'm good just the way I am. I know there's somebody, I know there's a gentleman that's watching this program tonight. And I know for a fact that he said, well, the reason why I had not obeyed the gospel is because I don't guess I, I really don't believe that I'm lost. Now, if you really don't believe you're lost, you're saying, well, I don't really need Jesus. I don't need anything he, he did for me. I don't need the sacrifice on the cross. I don't, need to, I don't need to contact his blood. You're basically saying, hey, I'm, I'm fine where I am. I don't need this. Listen, if you don't think you need a product, you're, not, you're certainly not going to buy it. You know, you just try to sell a product to someone who doesn't want it. You, you, you go door to door, try to sell a product. Hey, if they don't think they need a vacuum cleaner, they're not going to buy a vacuum cleaner. If they don't, if they don't think they, they need a, 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 a widget or whatever you're selling, they're not going to buy it. But if you convince them they need it, they'll buy two of them. See, if you don't think you need the gospel, friends, you're not going to buy it. You're not going to, you're not going to buy into it. In Acts 13, 46, does that mean we're off the air? Is that just that TV? Acts 14, or excuse me, Acts 13, uh, 46. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said. Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. They judged themselves unworthy. They said, we don't need it. They pushed it away from them. Now, I know that's why some of you aren't obeying the gospel. Because you've got it in your mind. I don't need it. You've got it in your mind. You're fine just the way you are. But I tell you one thing, friends. One day, one day you're going to bust hell wide open. And you're going to say, man, I sure wish I needed it. I wish I had it. I sure wish that I had obeyed the gospel. I sure wish I'd come out of these man-made churches and gave them, given up these man-made traditions. You may think you don't need it now, friends, but one day's coming, you're going to need the Lord, and the Lord's going to laugh at you. Proverbs chapter 1, God says, you, 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 you scorned my, my wisdom. You put it away from me, think you didn't need it. One day I'm going to laugh at you. Your calamity comes, and I'm going to laugh at you because you put it away. And you know what? There's some members of the church. There's some people who have obeyed the gospel. They've been baptized for the remission of sins. They've been added to the Lord's church. They've turned their back on the Lord. And then when the trouble comes, when the hardships come in life, you go, you go crying back to the Lord. Why do you think the Lord's going to bless you now after you turn your backs on him? You better wake up. You think you don't need it? That's why when you see the truth, you won't accept it because you think you don't need it. Here's another reason. Here's another reason, fear. Here's another reason, Proverbs 29, 25. Here's what the wise man says. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. 
Some people don't accept the truth because they have a fear. Not a proper fear of God, but they fear the unknown. You see, they fear the unknown, or excuse me, they fear, they fear the known. They fear something that they know is going to happen. Watch this. In John 7, 13, the reason why people didn't talk about Jesus was because they had a fear of somebody. How be it no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. Why? Because the Jews had made a statement that anybody who confessed Jesus would be put out of synagogue. In John 12, 42, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. They were afraid. They were afraid if we confess Jesus is the Messiah, and we say he is the Son of God, we know what's going to happen. Ooh, it's going to be bad. We know people are going to ridicule us. They're going to put us out of synagogue. We're going to have a hard way to go. And so it's better for us just to kind of keep it to ourselves. See, you don't obey the truth because you're fear. You're afraid of something. You're afraid of something. You're, you're sitting there going, well, you know, I know what's going to happen. The minute I obey the gospel, my wife's going to be mad at me. The minute I obey the gospel, my daddy's going to be mad at me. The minute I obey the gospel, my brother or my sister's going to be mad at me. The minute I obey the gospel, all the, all the members of the church where I once was are going to be mad at me. And so you sit back there and you just hide in a little corner and you, you sneak down to your basement and you watch what does the Bible say in the word of the Lord and you don't tell anybody, you know. You know it's the truth, you know. You know it's the truth. But you're sitting there hiding. Why? Because you're afraid. That's why people, they hear the truth, but they don't obey it. They can see the truth. Oh, I know you're seeing it, friends. I know you see the truth. But you're afraid of something. You're afraid of something. And you don't want anybody to question you about it. You know, you don't want anybody to question you about it because then you might have to give an answer. Look, in John 9, 13 through 41, there's an account of the, of the uh, uh, blind man. And people were asking him about how he got his sight back. And listen to what they said. They brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. And he said unto, him, unto them, He put clay on mine eyes and washed, and I do see. Verse 16, Therefore, said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. They say unto the blind man, Again, What sayest thou of him that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, He's a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. They wouldn't even believe that the man had been blind before. They thought he's just making it up. Now, this was a man that was known to be blind. Blind from birth. See? And so they called his parents. And they said, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and we know that he was born blind. But by what means, verse 21, but by what means he now seeth, we know not, and who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age. Ask him and let him talk for himself. Let him speak for himself. Let me tell you something, friends. You're afraid of something. The reason why you won't obey the gospel, you, you're afraid of something. You're sitting out there. You know there's only one kind of church in the Bible, and it's the church of Christ. And you know if you could find a man-made church in the Bible, if you could find the church you're in, in name, in practice, in organization, in belief, in doctrine, if you could find that church in the Bible, you'd already taken up that $1,000 that we've been offering for, for, for 10 years, and you'd be, you'd be rich. You know it's the truth. You know there's only one kind of church in the Bible, and you know you've got to be in that church to be saved. Christ the Savior of the body. Ephesians 5, 23, you know you've got to be a member of it, but you won't do something. You're afraid of something. I think you're afraid of your parents. I think you're afraid of your friends. I think you're afraid of your co-workers. You ought to be afraid of God. It's what you ought to be afraid of. Now let me talk to some of these members of the church. You know what? 
there's some members of the church that are afraid too. They're afraid to tell people, yes, I'm in the church of Christ, and yes, you've got to be in the church of Christ to be saved. Everybody in the church of Christ may not make it to heaven, but everybody that makes it to heaven is going to be in the church of Christ. And you're afraid to say that. You're afraid to talk. You know, there's people that say, well, y'all kind of rough on TV. You know, you need to you catch more flies with honey than you do vinegar. I'm not trying to catch flies, friend. See? I'm trying to get you to see the truth. And you're afraid. You're afraid. That's why people don't see the truth. It's because it's because they're afraid. Here's another reason. Here's another reason why people are afraid. They're afraid of the personal investment. What's it going to cost them? In Luke 17, 24, uh, Luke 14, 27, excuse me. Luke chapter 14 and verse 27, listen to what Jesus said. Whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intend to build a tower, sitteth not down first and count the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest happily, after he had laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold begin to mock him, saying, verse 30, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able to with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditional peace. So likewise, uh, so likewise, verse 33, so likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. You know why people are afraid of the truth? Even though they can see it. They see it. It's as plain as day. And the reason why they don't accept the truth is because what's it going to do to me? How's it going to affect me? What am I going to have to give up? You know, I hear people, I've heard people say that, well, when I get my life straightened up, I'm going to come to the Lord. Friends, if you, if you can straighten your life up without coming to the Lord, you don't need the Lord. If you, can, if you can get everything in your life right, then you don't need the Lord. And so what you're thinking, what you're realizing is, if I come to Jesus, if I come to the Lord, I obey the gospel, then I'm going to have to start living my life in such a way that I am holy. I'm going to put away some things, see? I'm going to have to put away the drinking and the smoking and the drugs. I'm going to put away the gambling. And some will say, well, I just can't do it. No, you can do it. It's just you don't want to do it. See, that's what it is. See, you're going to have to make an investment. Friends, half of knowing what you want is knowing what you must give up in order to get it. Look, we, just think for, for, for instance, we live in a pretty tough economy. And you may have some debt. You may, you may have some credit card debt. You may be trying to get out of some debt because you know the economy's tanking. And you know you need to have some money to save for a rainy day. And you say, I'm going to get out of debt. Well, you know what? Half of knowing what you want is knowing what you're going to have to give up. If you want to get out of debt, it may mean you're going to have to give up cable for a little while. It may mean you're going to have to give up going out to eat pizza every week. You're going to have to give up something. See? It may mean you sell that car that you're paying $500 a month on, and you're going to get down here to get one of these, uh, you know, beaters that you're having to drive around, maybe put a little oil in every week or so, that's paid for in order to pay off a debt. See, it's, you got to give up something to get something. What you going to give up to get it? That's the cost. And some of us say, no, it costs too much. If I obey the Lord, it's going to cost me too much. Jesus said unto him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not laid where to lay his head. These are individuals that came to Jesus and said, Lord, I'll follow you wherever. Jesus said, look, you coming after me. You going to be one of my disciples? Don't expect to have everything, everything at your fingertips, these big, nice, fluffy houses, fluffy couch, big screen TV, air conditioner blowing hot. Man, I'm, I'm living a hardship life here. I don't even have a place to lay my head. So if you're coming after me uh, seeking wealth and fame, you you fat, you you chasing the wrong person. Another disciple said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Follow me and let the dead bury the dead. You know what you're gonna do, friends? Count the cost. What's it gonna talk? What's it gonna cost if you obey the gospel? You're gonna have to put put aside your family. 
You want to put them second in your life. They can't be first. You can't say, you can't say, well, I'm going to put the Lord first until family, and then I'm going to put the Lord second. Nope, can't do that. Jesus is not saying you got to hate your family. I know he says, if you don't hate your mother, father, sister, brother, and so forth, you can't be my disciple. But what he meant by that is you have to love them less. Compared to the love for the Lord, you're going to have to hate them. You're going to have to be willing to say, no, the Lord comes first. What, what are you going to invest in it? Now, I know you're seeing the truth, friends. The question is, why aren't you obeying? Why aren't you moving? Uh, we'll, we'll take some phone calls. You put the, line, uh, put the phone numbers up. But why aren't you obeying the gospel? What's holding you back? What's holding you back? You know? Is this the reason why? You know, there's some people that just don't obey the truth because they just don't love the truth. They'll just kick and scream against anything that remotely looks like the truth. I hope that's not where you are, friends. I hope this is not you. I hope that you're not one of these individuals that just fight against the truth just because you know that you're going to have so much to change and you just hate the truth, you don't want to hear it. Look what Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2.10. He said, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Is that where you are? Are you being deceived because you really don't love the truth? Is that, is that really what, what, what you're getting down to? Listen, here's the contrast. The Thessalonians, Paul said to the Thessalonians, chapter 2, he said some, some folks are going to be deceived because they don't love the truth. But look what he said in 1 Thessalonians, one book before, the letter that he wrote before, 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. Here's what he said. He said about the Thessalonians, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men. Ye received it, but as in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you to believe. You receive the truth as the word of God. You don't stop and think and say, well, you know, I don't know if it's if it's a... Uh, going to be advantageous for me to obey the gospel you know what I think a lot of people join some of these churches these churches of men because it's advantageous to them they, they, they become members of, the, of these great big multi-member Baptist churches and Lutheran churches Presbyterian churches because well you know what it, it helps my business give more contacts you know I can network well you can't do that with the truth when you obey the gospel, you need to obey it because it's the word of God. Because in truth, it's the word of God. You're holding to it because it is the word of God. You have to obey it because that's what you love. Look, in John 8, 43, John 8, 43, listen to what Jesus says. He says, why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in truth, because there is no truth in him. Because he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Verse 45. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Why? They just didn't love the truth. There's no way they could deny that Jesus was telling them the truth. As a matter of fact, Nicodemus, one of their own, came to him and said, We know that our teacher come from God. No man can do these things except God be with him. That's John chapter 3. They couldn't deny. They couldn't deny it was the truth. See? But yet, they still rejected it. Why? It's because they didn't love the truth. They just really don't love the Word of God. They just really don't love the Word of God. Verse 46, Jesus said, Which of you convinceth me of sin? If I, and if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? You know I'm not lying because you can't prove where I'm wrong. Therefore, I must be telling the truth 
but yet you won't believe me. He said, He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not because you're not of God. You know why these people call and they want to, they want to argue about the plan of salvation? They want to argue about the sinner's prayer. They want to argue about tithing. They want to argue about the churches. You know, defend man-made churches. They want to fight about being a priest or a prophetess. Went to, went to see prophetess Shirley O'Neill the other day. <clears throat> and her husband said that uh, uh, we, we came up there with the camera. We had a camera in hand. Came up there and he said, you know, you, you might as well have carried a gun. That's the same as bringing a gun up here and pointing my face. I said, why don't you want to answer the truth? Because that offends me. You know what? You don't want to answer the truth because you don't love the truth. You know why you don't hear God's word? Because you don't love the truth. There's not a prophet or a prophetess in the world today that can prove they are one according to the scripture. And when you, show, when you show them that, you know what, if you've got, if you've got a gift of, of, of God, why don't you just demonstrate it? If you've got a gift of discernment, demonstrate it. If you've got a gift of, of, of healing, demonstrate it. Speaking in tongues, demonstrate it. Interpretation, just demonstrate it. 1 Corinthians 2, 4. If you really love the truth, you'll do what God says. You know why they fight? You know why they moan and groan? And carry on calling and call us bad names and everything? I'll tell you why. Because they don't love the truth. They don't love the truth. Let them go. We'll, we'll take them on through. You going to work, my Lord? Yes, how are you this evening? I'm doing very well. That's good. I was wondering, could I get you to tell me what this uh, scripture means? It's in Matthew chapter 17. And it's from verse... Um, 24 down to, I reckon, to the end. Exactly what does that, what, what are they talking about? I, I, I can't get no understanding of it. All right. And when they would come to Capernaum, they received tribute money. They that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Does not your master pay tribute? He said, Yes. And when he was coming to the house, Jesus prevented him. That means he, he went before him. He headed him off to pass. And he said, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? of their own children or of strangers. And Peter said unto him, of strangers, Jesus said unto him, then are the children free. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea, cast a hook, take up a fish, and that first cometh up, and when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money, that take given to them for me and thee. All right, so they were asking Peter, why, why don't you pay taxes? And Jesus says, who pays taxes, the children of the king or, or strangers? And he says, well, the strangers do. Well, Jesus is the child of the king. He's the son of the king, isn't he? Right, right. So he should be exempt from paying the taxes. That's what he's saying. He said, I, I shouldn't be exempt from paying taxes. You know, I'm free. I shouldn't have to pay these taxes. But, but we don't want to offend them. Because they don't understand that I'm the son of God. Therefore, you go to the sea, catch a fish. There's going to be some money in his mouth. And go ahead and pay his taxes for me and you. Oh, for him and Peter. For, for, yeah, for me and Peter. Yeah, me and you. Okay. For, for Jesus and Peter. Right. Saying, he was exempt. This was actually a temple tax. Right, and it, it, was, it was a temple tax that all Jewish men had to pay. But Jesus... Jesus was the, the Lord of the temple. He shouldn't have to pay that tax. Right. See, he's basically saying, I'm going to pay the tax to myself. <laughs> That's right. See, but, but he said, but they don't understand that, so we'll go ahead and pay it. Just so they're not offended. Does that help? That helped a whole lot. All right. Very much. All right. Just doing my job. That's what I'm here for. Thanks for your call. All right. You're on a word from the Lord. Hey, James. It's a good program tonight. Hey. Thanks. I, look, um, you know, one thing, the reason these people are not getting away from their man-made traditions, I think, is a lot of peer pressure. Uh, I meant to bring this up on the program earlier. Uh, we get a little ad paper in Danville called the Piedmont Shopper, and I noticed last week in that that the 
Soldiers of the Cross, so-called, at Brian Edwards Church, the motorcycle game, they're having another ride, and many people were, I don't know whether they were sponsors or, or what they were, but I know there were probably a dozen or more sponsors in, listed in that paper, and one of them was the um, elect chief of police, Mike Mondale. He's running for chief of police, and I don't know whether he's sponsoring this ride or he's going to be a participant in it or whatever, but it'd be something to, to find out, you know, um, and, and how is that being, you know, separation of church and state? Is he, he's trying to get both by riding with the Hells Angels or, or what? <laughs> Well, it obviously it obviously shows that that religion is just a a vehicle for him. You That's know, exactly right. think what we said earlier. It's, it's just kind of a ve- it's a tool for him. You know, it helps me climb climb the ladder. Uh, That's like uh, you know some of these. Uh, uh, my bag, I'll scratch yours. Yeah, yeah. It, well, it's it's all it's all it's you know the political machine. Yep. Uh, let me identify with this big group over here so that. Uh, I'll be, I'll have more credibility, or more, or be received by, by more. You know, I notice a lot of these uh, folks on on TV, and the big, big news anchors, whatever, are uh, personalities in the in the news arena. Uh, they they convert to Catholicism. They convert to Catholicism because the people that own these big news corporations are Catholics. Yeah. You know, so it's kind of like well. I'm gonna get in good with the boss. Just, just go with the majority. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, yeah, they don't really love the truth. You know, they don't love it as as it is the word of God. It's more of a, you know, it's just, a, it's just a tool. That's well, right. I'm hoping people will wake up, but I tell you what, the way it's looking, I don't know. You're right. I don't either. I don't either. We're gonna keep speaking it anyway. That's right. That's right. All right thank, thank you, Dave. Thank you, brother. All right. Well, they don't love the truth, and they don't want to hear it either. Look at this. Acts seven fifty one. Acts 7.51, here's uh, uh, Stephen talking to these uh, people who have resisted uh, the truth. Ye stiff-necked and circumcised and heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the f- prophets have not your fathers persecuted and have they slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers? Verse 53, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. The, when they have heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfast into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Uh, and they said, uh, the heavens opened, the sun, I see the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, ran upon him one accord, cast him out of the city and stoned him. They killed him. Why? Because they didn't like to hear the truth. You're on the word from the Lord. Welcome to the program. You're on the word from the Lord. Well, you're on the air. Huh? You're on the air. Hello. Going once. You're on the air. Hello. Hello. All right. You're on the air. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Well, you got a question? I want to make the key to yourself. Can you go to hell? I'm sorry? If the key to yourself, can you go to hell? One more time. I heard that if the key to yourself, you will go to heaven. Is that true? Jews? If the key to yourself, we go to hell. I, I, can't, I can't understand you, sir. I can't understand you. Let me put you on hold. Mark, get the, get line three. You're on the word from the Lord. Hey, James, how you doing? I'm doing well. I think that uh, for me reading the Bible and being a new Christian, I've, I've come to the conclusion that man uh, thinks that God's word is interchangeable to his desires. And it's just like the laws that we make for our country. We think that if enough people don't like it, they can change it. But in the Bible, God says, you know, my word from the beginning because I've given to you since the beginning in, in Romans and the same sex marriage and everything else is just man's desires to seek his own uh, for his wickedness to suppress the word of God it says that in the, I wrote an article today in the editorial card about same sex marriage 
and I use Romans as my reference. And he says that I'll turn away from you and let you do what you want to do, but I won't be in it. And you'll suffer the consequences to your actions. And it goes on to tell us about how kids will be disrespectful of the parents and things like that. And if anybody reads that, and then they go over to, uh, uh, I think it's Romans 12, to tell you how, how what, what's the respect of you as a Christian. And you'll find out the things we do are totally in, uh, in, in uh, difference to what God wants of us, you know what I'm saying? But the main thing I want to say is that people got to understand the Bible is not like man's law. You just can't change it when you get a desire to change it. His word won't change, you know what I mean? Right. And and now, who, tell me who you are. Mike. Mike who? I come to the church over there. I, I visited y'all a couple times. In, in Martinsville? Yes, sir. Okay, all right. Like I said, look at the editorial column in Martinsville Bulletin. You get a chance to read that article. Okay. It's not me that's saying that. It's just what I read through right. the Word of God. It says you must study to be approved. So if you don't study and you take another man's word, I can lead you anywhere. That's right. Well, and, here, and here's another point along the same lines. Why do you think all these churches of men have come about into existence? Is it not for the same reason? We, we, want to, we want to make it fit what we want instead of us fitting what God wants? Right, but it's human nature to gravitate toward what makes them feel good, you right. know what I mean? exactly right. Word says that's why we <clears throat> commit sin, because it makes us feel good. And what they don't realize, too, is doing what God said makes you feel good, too. Yeah, but I'm just saying it's, I, it's human nature. I know, I know, but I'm saying we don't, we don't appreciate the, the good feeling that comes from doing what God said. We want the good feeling that comes from the sin. But one thing I found out, though, James, I found out, though, it's, it's not that many. It, it couldn't be a job in this day and time because as soon as you start messing with that pocketbook or that paycheck, people will run away from the truth as quick as they can or they'll, they'll, or they'll stay away from it. They won't interject themselves and stand up for what's true. You know what I mean? Right. They don't want to lose that paycheck. Right. And the churches don't want to lose no uh, tithes, so they'll accept anybody in there. Exactly. Well, that's exactly right. They don't you know, want to lose that's, tithes. That's, you know, that's, that's what we've said numerous times on this program, like Jerry Falwell, you know, the late uh, Jerry Falwell, you know, he said, we're going to have to rethink this thing on marriage and divorce because, you know, we've got 50% divorce rate. Well, why, why rethink it? Well, I'll just stick with what the Bible says and, and let everybody conform to uh, the Word instead of trying to change the Word. Well, the only oh. thing I'm going to say, I'm going to let you go, James. All right. That you, if, if you don't stick to what he says, people in the world look at it and say, well, what's the point of me? joining a church when I've got to deal with that foolishness in the church just as exactly. well as in the street. I agree. I agree. You have a good evening. All right. Thanks for calling. All right. So they don't love the truth. Well, let me let me just say this, friends. I, su I suspect that you probably see yourself in some of these scenarios. Either you're someone who's holding on tradition or maybe you're afraid of what people are going to say or how, how they're going to treat you. Maybe, maybe it is you're, you're just going to have to give up too much. Maybe you realize, you know what, I'm going to have to make too many changes in my life. But I tell you what, friends, it's worth it. It's worth the change for the reward. Paul said it's a lot of affliction for the reward that awaits us. So it's just, you know, it's small, small potatoes, really, when it gets down to it. Conforming to God's will and giving up your own will. But I think people resist changing the truth. They resist changing even when they're shown the truth. Because they'll sit there and they'll say, yeah, that's right, and then sit there and do nothing. You, 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 want, you, want, you want me to prove it? I'm going to tell you right now, friends, there's one church in the Bible. It's the church of Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That church started in Acts 2 when Peter said to those people on the day of Pentecost, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. They were added unto them, unto the church, daily, such as should be saved. Acts 2, 47. That's when the church began. It was started. The church is the body of Christ. There's only one. One body, Ephesians 4, 4, and it is the body of Christ that, made, that is made up of the saved. And Christ is going to save those individuals when he returns, Ephesians 5, 23. And if you're in a man-made church, a church of men, you're going to be lost, my friend. You're going to have to give an account to God about why you're in a church that his son did not die for, he did not say anything about, and you expect to get to heaven for disobeying him. Now, I'm telling you that, friends, and you know what? I know that you're going to sit there and resist the truth because you won't, you won't come out of those churches where you're in. You're going to sit right there. 
The devil's got such a hold on you that you, you're not going to give it up. I hope you will. I hope you will. I hope you love the truth enough. Is it important to you? Will you really accept the truth? You know? Even, even if the truth is not what you thought it was. You know, you thought that, oh, I'm, I'm okay in all these, uh, in this different religion. Oh, no. No, you're not. Will you let go of it and just accept the truth? The truth will set you free. Friends, we're wrapping our time. I appreciate you watching. Appreciate the calls. Remember to watch us on WGSR 47.1, WGSR 47.tv. Remember the, te the tent meeting going on June 22 through July 3rd. And always remember to watch What Does the Bible Say? Sunday nights at 8.30, Thursday nights at 8, A Word from the Lord, Thursday nights at 9. And uh, until next time, until next week, make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. Have a good night. at first. I thought he was a nut. I mean, once I read the Bible for myself, I'm able to accept the truth now. All right. And it doesn't make me angry. I'm talking about the Lauren Hardy show on Wednesday. Don't worry about them. Some of y'all, get off of it, would you? Don't dare do that again. Shut that up.